Hello, this is Sandra from Raising Math Superstars with my guest speaker here today, my Rubik's Cube expert here. And I wanted to just hop on today and talk about a Rubik's Cube and an abacus because we've been having a lot of fun with both of these. And I realized these are two tools that tell us a lot about good ways and bad ways to teach math. Um, so let's talk about one thing. Okay, we've been having a lot of fun with this. This has been a famous or er, really fun Christmas present. And um, the boys and their dad have been getting really into solving these. So they've been watching lots of YouTube videos and figuring out um, all the different tricks for solving them. Do you want to tell them what we talked about here? So what's one of the most difficult things about solving a Rubik's Cube? Well, the most, one of the most difficult things about solving a Rubik's Cube is that it, it's very fun to do, except you might just forget what to do, like, oh, it's a yellow line, I forget what to do on a yellow line, or, oh, I forget what's the algorithm for this, yeah. or, oh, how do you get this in place here? Good, thank you. So on YouTube, they've been watching a lot of videos that show them all the different algorithms. That was interesting, that comes up. Um, and there's, if you've done a Rubik's Cube, you know about all the different rules for what to do when. This is a little bit over my head, but they're having fun with it. But I thought it was really interesting that one phrase that they keep saying is, I forget which algorithm to do. And even my five-year-old, he's getting really into it, but he says the same thing. He's like, what algorithm do I use now? And they're going around with that. So I thought that was perfect because to me, that's how most people approach math is you learn a set of steps. You learn, okay, in this scenario, we do this and it goes on and on. But then what do you do when you get stuck? You're like, oh, which algorithm do I do? So in my last video, I talked about math coding, how sometimes we approach math as if we're writing a code that we're going to program into our kids' brains. And when they see a certain situation, they just find the code package that matches it and run through the code steps. Well, that works well for a computer. It works well if you're sort of, sort of solving Rubik. Oh my goodness, solving a Rubik's cube. But when we when it comes to math, math makes sense. That's really my catchphrase. Um, math is built on a foundation of logic of things that work. And if you s understand how it all works together, you're not stuck in this realm of pulling algorithms and trying to see um, what we have where. So I have something to share with you just briefly today about why we don't want to approach math as if we're solving a Rubik's Cube and the magic of an abacus. Okay, so you've probably seen me talk about this before, but stick with me here. Um, if we're doing Rubik's Cube style or um, math coding, if anybody has a better way to explain that, uh, leave a comment and I'll, I can pick up a better phrase for that. Um, but this is how traditionally, and um, for most of us and most of our kids, we've probably learned something like this. Okay, 15 plus 28. First of all, if you're doing Rubik's Cube style or math coding style, you have to stack them. Kids don't know what else to do if they're not stacked. Okay. And then eight plus five goes into a realm where you have to pull up the certain code package to know that's more than 10. So that's going to be a 13. So that's one down here, one up here. And then you add, so you get 43. Okay. It, it goes on and on, of course. But what um, you can do if you have an abacus hang on with me one second here. Um, if you help kids build up number sense where they truly are building out numbers in their place values with groups of fives and tens, then when you see 15 plus 28, kids will know that 15 is a 10 and a five. Those are subitized or numbers you can see instantly. And then 28 Again, there's a foundation you have to build before you get to this point, and my green screen is making this crazy. But um, 28 is two tens and an eight, and all of that is instant if you've built up to this point with the invisible beats, with five and three more. Okay, so you have two tens, five and three more. They instantly pull that over. Now, if you've laid that foundation, built up a good sense of what numbers are, how they're built, how they're taken apart, how to instantly recognize them. Um, the numbers just, the answers jump off the page at you. And eventually you get to the point where you have a, I like to tell my students, you have a brain abacus. Okay, you do it enough times with your hands so that this gets imprinted on your brain 
when you close your eyes, the number 15 looks like 10 beads and five more beads. 28 looks like two rows of tens and an eight, which looks like a five and three. Then they know that this five and this five combine to make a 10. So you can do the exchanging with adding a five in there. So you complete it out and then adding the three more. There's a whole number of ways if we're teaching um, actual addition, we have a lot of strategies to do with that. But anyways, I just wanted to briefly talk about there's so much sense behind math. We don't have to treat it like a Rubik's cube. I guess that's like my one liner for this little video I wanted to share. Um, it's not, it can be, if we're programming a computer, it can be broken up into a hundred different rules that are all isolated and different and you just memorize them. And then if those rules are too much, sometimes we take it a step further and we just have kids memorize their math facts and we just do flashcards until you have it all memorized. That's a really shaky foundation. That's like building a house on sand. It's the first wind comes or settling happens over time. That's forgotten and your house falls down. But if you lay a solid foundation and knowing what numbers are, um, just build that confidence of how to work with them, then you can see how um, the numbers, the answers just kind of jump out at you. So let's do another example here. Six times four. Okay, for a lot of kids, uh, six times four is just a memorized math fact. And you kind of do enough flashcards that kids get familiar with the answer. But then it's so abstract. It's just what we call naked numbers. Um, you just have numbers on a page without any meaning to them. And it doesn't help them if they forget it. And it doesn't help them go on to bigger things. So we like to do this. And I have my helper um, hiding. You can come back here. If we do six times four, and if you're used to, whether you use an abacus or a rec and rec or a beaded string or a lot of 10 frames, um, the idea of working with groups of tens with subgroups of fives is the key here. Um, you can get a green, a better abacus that doesn't fade out on a green screen even. Okay. But anyways, four times six. So we have four groups of six. What kids are going to know, first of all, four groups of six is key to understanding multiplication. And it can also be six groups of four. If they're learning to build their numbers this way, they instantly see it as five and one more. Okay, you wanna talk to us here, helper? What do you see when you look at this? Yeah. Does, the, does the answer just kind of jump out at you? Um, what, what do you see here? Are we doing this side or this, this side? side? Oh. So we have, okay. I'm sorry, four groups of six. I probably said that backwards. What do you see here? So I I see there's a 10. A 10? Here. This is like a 10 frame. It has 20, five on top, five on bottom. So 10, 10 and 20, 10. and then four. Good. Good, good. Thank you. So if they get to the point where they're visualizing all of this, they're not memorizing facts and answers. They're not even memorizing strategies. It's just a number sense. They get They really build this intuition about what numbers are and how they work. So they see this and they're like, 10, 20, and 4, 24, okay? And then you can build on that and build um, to the point where you're using the distributive factor, distributive property. So you know that anytime you have a 6, that's actually a 5 and a 1. So what we're really doing here is 4 times 5. We can say 4 times 5 plus 1. So you have 4 times 5 plus 4 times 1. This is an excellent introduction to algebra um, and it just it comes up in so much more in math beyond second or third grade math so four times five even when I talk about fives um, we get into showing just like he pointed out here two groups of five is a ten so for every two groups of five that's a ten so basically we're doing another fantastic strategy number sense strategy here where you do half and double this has a lot more implications and can be used to do really large problems. So four groups of five is the same as two groups of 10. And that helps because to most kids, that's an instantly recognizable fact, which is 20. And then four times one is four. Okay, so you do a lot with the concrete tangible um, beads until it becomes mental math. Once that's really solid and they can do it with their hands and see that in their head, then you can introduce the numbers and that's built on a foundation. It's not just memorized naked numbers. It's actual um, actual objects that they're seeing. Then you can extend that to do something. I'm gonna kind of switch strategies here. Um, 
if we're doing, let me start off with something just to kind of talk about the strategy. If we're doing two times nine, we would pull over two groups of nine. And then we talk a lot in my classes about making that tens because nines, when they grow up, want to be tens. What would we do here? My helper still with me. Well, we would push these over and then we'll see it's 20. Uh -huh. But it turns out because we added two, we have to take away two. Uh -huh. So it's actually 10, 5, 8, 18. Perfect. So 10, 5, and 3. And, is 18. Could, and I could also tell right away without doing that because I know 10 minus 2 is 8. Perfect. So they build up all of that strategy. Um, I'm using my son because he's here and willing to work with me, but we do this. I do this with all my students and in my courses too. Um, so nines turn into tens. That's a much more friendly number. And then since we borrowed the, those to make them tens, we have to give them back at the end. Okay. So that's good. They can do that with their hands. They can get the mental impression of it. They can kind of build out a rule of it. And then you get to the point where you can use that same strategy for bigger numbers. So 15 times nine, once they really get the hang of it, um, you'll get to the point where you do 15 times 10 and then just take off the 15. That's technically 15 times one. So we're doing the distributive property in action here. And then we know 15 times 10 is 150. You can think of 15. There's, It's all like really intuitive by this point because you think of the 15 in the groups of 10 and five, so you back up 10 spaces to 140, back up another five spaces to 135, okay? So you get to the point where you can do all of that in your head um, because it's based on this foundation of building out numbers. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say, but basically um, the Rubik's Cube is, for anybody who's just hopping on now, our Rubik's Cube is my example of Something where you need to learn a bunch of algorithms and then you have to figure out what works when. Green screen is making it crazy. Um, and it's easy to get lost. So my boys um, are getting really good at figuring out all of the rules to use. But still, all day long, I'm hearing phrases like, which algorithm do I use now? And that's how we consider math a lot. So we want to kind of break through that in our own with our own kids. Not just to see it as a bunch of fragmented algorithms that are not connected and you just have to remember what happens when but build out a beautiful coherent cohesive picture of what numbers are using a tool like a wreck and wreck and abacus number lines beaded lines um where they really build that visual intuitive sense of what numbers are and then you can do anything with it okay so you slow down at first to build that number sense so that you can speed up later and do anything and it's um you'll develop rules of how it all works, but kids don't even need to know what to do exactly in what case, because the numbers are in their head. They own them. They're in control of the numbers. The numbers are not in control of them. And um, they are in, they have the power to move those numbers around and make it what they want. Okay. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we'll be back later with some more fun math. Thanks for watching.